Well, it's word time. It's time for us to take an opportunity to just settle down and pull out from the uh, busyness of life or taking care of some natural things and being able to focus in on our spiritual life. And that's very important as children of God because God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And God's word is spirit and life. And so the word of God is designed to go in and minister to our born again spirit, strengthen us with might in our inner man so that we can walk in the things of God, so that we can uh, be faithful to that which God has revealed in our hearts. Well, thank you for joining me for this time to get in God's word. And I know you love the word of God. If not, you would not be consistently coming back to the table to partake of this uh, knowledge that God has given us in the earth. You know, the Bible say my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And it wasn't that knowledge was not available, but during that time, God's people was rejecting that knowledge. But thank God we are not rejecting the knowledge of God, but we are receiving the word of God. And not only are we receiving that word, but we are putting that word in operation in our life. Well, we're going to pray, then we're going to go right into the book of wisdom, that is the book of Proverbs. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your wisdom and your peace and your joy. And we thank you for Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all to the glory of God. And now, Father, as we go into the word of God, we thank you that it is you who give us understanding, knowledge and wisdom so that we can build our lives, build our families, build your kingdom work in the earth. And so we praise you for that in the wonderful name of Jesus. We ask that you would give us the ability to rightly divide the word of truth, Father, to be able to interpret these proverbs as you have ordained them to be interpreted, Father, so that we can live a victorious life in Christ to the glory of God. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Well, we're going into Proverbs 26 today. And Proverbs 26 is a very interesting chapter because it's one of those chapters whereby Solomon, the teacher of wisdom, is instructing us on relational matters uh, that we all have to contend with as being human beings in a natural world. And a lot of times when it comes to Proverbs, sometimes people think it's not really a spiritual book because it deals with so many of everyday common experiences that we have as believers. And also these things that we are dealing with in Proverbs, you can really relate to them. You can relate to them in your own personal walk, and you can also relate to them in your own personal experiences with various people and in various contexts of life. And so really, this book of wisdom, really, you know, it doesn't talk about things that's not familiar with us, things that are very familiar with us. And matter of fact, as you go through Proverbs, you will be able to identify certain experiences that you've had and even certain people that you've encountered along your journey. And wisdom is not here to cause us to sit back and judge people, but wisdom wants us to be smart. Wisdom wants us to be discerning. Wisdom wants us to be able to know how to maneuver in this fallen world in dealing with people who are fallen creatures and even those who are born again who can uh, begin to operate in that carnal nature and, and do and carry out things just as those sinners would carry those things out. And so we're going to be talking about uh, uh, things in chapter 26 that wisdom tells us we need to avoid. And some of the things it specifically tells us are people or characters, uh, uh, characteristics that we need to avoid in people's lives are people, individuals, is individuals that are fools. Yes, he starts this chapter out. As a matter of fact, in the first 12 verses of Proverbs 26, uh, the writer specifically addresses the issue of a fool. And then he warns us about how to avoid lazy people. Then he tells us to avoid mischievous people. And then he closes by telling us to avoid malicious people. You know, sometimes Christians have a problem when it comes to, you know, having to avoid certain people because they think that's not walking in love. And, you know, they got a flawed understanding of the mercy of God and everything. And they just lack wisdom. They really lack wisdom. Now, Proverbs, wisdom tells us to avoid these individuals for a reason. 
First of all, so that we won't be influenced by their spirits, by their cunningness. Another thing is that we don't come down to their level and begin to act like them and join in with them. And thirdly, so they can realize that those who are sincere about God is not going to perpetrate and, you know, act like, you know, you didn't do anything or you're not behaving outside of the will of God. They're going to be real with you. And so here, that's why the Bible tells us that we've got to avoid certain people. Matter of fact, in Romans chapter 16, listen to what Paul told the Christians how to avoid certain people even in the church community that was self-centered and uh, all they wanted to do was carry out their own agenda. Creating what? Creating division within the fellowship. So listen to Romans 16, verse number 17 and 18. It reads like this. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Remember I told you, these people who claim when you, you know, even if the, if the spiritual guys of the church tell them to avoid certain individuals uh, uh, that may have been part of the fellowship, to avoid them. And they get all, you know, offended by, well, somebody trying to control. No, there's a reason for that. And the Bible said that these individuals, they use two things. They use smooth talk and flattery. You know what that is? They use convincing words. They use speech that calls people to be what? To be taken into their subtle deception. And the Bible say that the people that they deceive are the minds of naive people. Listen, listen. It is not the will of God for his people to be naive. Yes, that's not the will of God. So let's get into this book of Proverbs and let's begin the journey through here and let's begin to deal with these type individuals that wisdom tells us that we need to avoid. It begins in verse 1 of chapter 26 and it reads like this. Matter of fact, chapter 1, uh, 26 verse 1 through 12 deals with the fool. So we're going to deal with the fool first. Then we're going to talk about the lazy person. Then we're going to look at the mischievous, mischievous person. And then we're going to talk about the malicious person. Well, it says, as snow in summer and rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. Now, the Bible reveals that this particular individual here that is identified as a fool is an individual that we should avoid. Yes. Now, we know from Psalms 24, verse 1a, the Bible specifically says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So we know those people who claim to be atheists are fools. And the Bible tells us we need to what? We need to make sure that we do not honor them. We do not esteem them. We do not get this now. We do not place them in positions of leadership. Why? Because it is not fitting for it is not proper. It, uh, they are getting in a position where they're going to they are going to hurt a lot of people. You know, these type people are good at masquerading themselves. You got to understand now, Satan is the master at masquerading. And get this now, in 2 Corinthians 11, 4, 14, the Bible says, For Satan himself masquerades himself as an angel of light. Yes, he'll put a title on himself. He will try to project himself as though he's a Christian, a man of God, a woman of God. Yes, yes, he will, he, will, he will infiltrate into what? Into the fellowship by masquerading himself. Not only do he cover himself in those deceptive ways, but the Bible say in Genesis 3, 5, listen to what Satan said to Eve, but you will be like God. What he uses? Flattery. Yes, he tries to use words to make you think that he's looking out for your best interest or he's in your corner or get this now or he's stroking your ego. 
So, so Satan is the master at masquerading himself. How much more we have to be careful in Proverbs 1 says, honor is not fitting just like what? Summer, snow is not fitting for summer. If it's summertime, it's not fitting to have snow. And also rain is not fitting for harvest. If it's time to go out and harvest the field, rain is not fit. Rain is fitting what? Before the harvest. Rain does what? It comes to prepare the harvest. But when it's time to reap the harvest, rain is not fitting. So Proverbs says, honor is not fitting for food. All right, let's go down. In verse 2, it tells us uh, we're going to have to handle food. You got to know how to handle food. All right, first of all, verse 2 said, Like a flittering sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without call shall not alight. In other words, do not fear them. Do not, re do not, do not fear a fool. A fool will try to be very intimidating. A fool will try to rule and, 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 and gain a, 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 a influence over people out of what? Out of fear. And just as an unjust, unjust curse will never be effective, a fool will never be effective when he tries to hurt those who are righteous. Yes, in Numbers 22 and 6, we see this when uh, uh, Balaam requested Balak to come uh, and curse uh, the children of Israel. It did not work. All right, verse 3 said, a whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the fool's back. We know that a whip is designed for what? To be able to get a horse to do what? To discipline the horse, to cause the horse to carry out that particular task that is necessary. A bridle for the donkey is the same thing. Well, when it comes to a fool, it, they require very strong discipline. You can't be light to a fool. You can't, you can't be, you know, average in discipline. You got to bring some heavy discipline to a fool. Verse 4 and 5 says this. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Well, I call this pick your battles wisely. These two verses, they are not contradicting themselves. The difference is the subject on which the fool is making pronouncements. In other words, if it's a secular matter, if it's a light matter, the Bible say in verse 4, just ignore the fool. Because if not, you're going to come down to their level. Have you ever been dealing with a fool and all of a sudden you got frustrated at yourself saying, why did I allow that person to draw me into that kind of foolishness? It can happen. So when you find yourself like that, the Bible say don't come down to their level. But if it's a major issue at hand and uh, definitely something of, 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 of dealing with spiritual truths, then he should be answered. Paul did that in the New Testament. Those false teachers were going around with false doctrine. They were, Paul had to what? He had to bring truth to that false doctrine. He had to bring truth to those people because of that false teaching. And there were times that people named people that was teaching that kind of doctrine. And that's sometimes you have to do that. You have to, and I don't care how popular they are. I don't care how, you know, how big uh, their church is as far as people going there and all this kind of stuff. If that doctrine is polluted, you have to warn the sheep. And there are times you're going to have to call their name out and let, your, uh, uh, let the flock know, don't go over there in that pasture. Why? There's, there's, there's polluted doctrine over there. There's false teaching over there. And that's not the spiritual food that God wants us. So there are times that you have to be silent with the food and there are times you have to open your mouth in order to bring truth because sometimes your silence is taken as agreement. And you got some weak leaders like that in the body of Christ. They see people doing stuff out of order and as soon as you get ready to address the person, they go over there in the sympathy corner. They go over there in the corner of trying to go and nurse their wounds and don't realize that God want that discipline so that person can repent and turn from that kind of behavior. I'm telling you, it's no time to have naive people on your team and leadership. 
Let's go to verse number six. He who sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off his own feet and drinks violence. I call this do not trust him. You cannot trust the fool, especially with a verbal message. Why? Because they will take the message that you give them to go carry out. They will distort it. They will, they will, they will basically tell a lie and it creates a, lie, uh, a, create a painful experience for yourself. All right, verse 7 said, like the legs of the lame that hang limp is a proverb in the mouth of fools. I call this do not heed the fool. A fool will misinterpret a parable. Yes, a fool will take something that's simple and plain and make it complicated. All right, verse 8 and 9, like one who binds a stone in a sling is he who gives honor to a fool. Like a thorn that goes into the hand of a drunkard is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. In other words, the Bible tells, do not praise a fool. Yes, the more you praise a fool, the more self-confident and deceived they become. Giving honor to a fool is like giving them ammunition. And so we got to make sure that we know how to handle a fool. Yes, you, you got to be very wise when you're dealing with a fool. All right, verse 10 says this, and I'm going to read verse 10 from the Amplified Bible. It says, but like an archer who wounds all, so is he who hires a fool or who hires a fool or chance passers by. I call this do not hire a fool. Like the archer who causes harm when he releases the arrows to everybody around him, so the fool will cause problems with other employees. Yes, when you hire a fool, it's going to create problems on the team. When you hire a fool, it's going to create problem in the company. So the Bible say, do not hire a fool. Verse 11 and 12, as a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. I call this impossible to deal with. A fool is a very difficult person to deal with. Why? Very seldom will they change. Very seldom will they uh, stop their negative and foolish behavior. They go from place to place and they repeat it. And that's what happened a lot of time. When fools go traveling around, that same spirit goes somewhere else and eventually their true colors will show up. Because why? There's a deep embeddedness of stubbornness on the inside of the spirit and mind of a fool. They are full of pride and deception. So Peter in 2 Peter uh, uh, 2.22, he identified these false teachers as those who are like dogs that return to their own vomit. Yes, or like a person with a soul and he go back and what? And he picks at that soul, soul, soul on their particular body. So he uses that same uh, uh, proverb or that same wisdom in that context. Why? Because a lot of times people that teach false doctrine, uh, they are so deceived that it's very hard for them to humble themselves and acknowledge I've been teaching uh, uh, polluted doctrine. I've been teaching false doctrine. All right, so verse 1 through 12 teaches us to avoid the fool and know how to handle a fool. You got to know how to handle a fool in your life. And I'm telling you right now, there are a lot of fools out there in the world and there are fools who come into the church. And sometimes Christians, they know how to play the fool. Yes, when they get in the flesh, they can play the fool. Well, in verses uh, 13 through 16, wisdom identifies another character uh, uh, that we need to avoid. And this is the slugger or the slowful person or what we call the lazy person. Again, wisdom is telling us to avoid these people for our own good and well-being. Because these people can have influence on us. These people can cause us to lower our standard. These people can win us over because they're very what? They're very subtle. They're very cunning. 
And so in verse 13 through 16, let's look at some of the attributes of this lazy person. It says, the lazy man says, there is a lion in the road, a fierce lion is in the street. In other words, the lazy person always have something to use as an excuse. I call it, hallelujah, they have an excuse for everything. And it get to a point where their excuses are so extreme that it makes no sense. They continue to make excuse after excuse for doing nothing, being irresponsible, being lazy. And here, the reason the person is, uh, this lazy person is saying, I cannot go out and work because there's a lion in the street. Well, I tell you what, <laughs> there's a possibility that could have been a lion, you know, roaming around, but it wasn't stopping everybody else from getting up, going to work. It wasn't stopping everybody else from going, taking their care of their responsibility. But here's the, what the point is. A lazy person is full of excuses. All right. Verse number 14 says, as a door turns on its hinges, so does the lazy man on his bed. I call it this. I call this the bed bug syndrome. In other words, the lazy person loves to sleep. And just like a door is on the hinge, what it does is go, go back and forth, but won't go nowhere else. And that's how a lazy person is. They usually go from the refrigerator to the bed. <laughs> and somebody allowed them to do that. You know, they always have somebody to support that. Well, we're not to support people being lazy when we know these people got the ability to go out and do like everybody else, work and take care of themselves. Let's go on, verse 15. The lazy man buries his hand in the bowl. It wearies him to bring it back to his mouth. I call this the low life of laziness. You see, the only direction for a lazy person is downward. Eventually, they will no longer uh, take care of their basic needs as well as their own personal hygiene because they avoid any exertion as possible. Anything that's going to require them to exert energy, anything that's going to require them to get up and do something with their lives, they're going to try to avoid it. And you know, even in the natural, when you don't do anything, physical activity with your muscles, what happens? They begin to just get weak. And that's what happens. The lazy person get to a point where life keeps going. It's, it's like a downward spiral. They get to the point where, man, they don't even take care of themselves. Their, their, whole, their, their whole appearance begins to change. You know, nappy head, can't go get it. Why, why don't you get a haircut? I don't have no money. <laughs> you know, and people, they, they go, well, I'll give you money to get a haircut. What you doing? You're supporting the lazy person. They're on a downward spiral. And something on the inside of them is going to have to click. You can do all you can and keep hoping and, and that they're going to change. But this person, as long as their needs are met, they usually don't change. Look at the prodigal son. Life got hard for him. He didn't, he didn't decide that he's going to take the pigs home with his, uh, uh, to his father. He left those pigs, you know. He got up out of that pig pen and uh, cause something clicked on the inside of him and he went back. And there are people, they, they don't want to leave that crowd. They don't want to leave those people they're hanging with that ain't going nowhere. Because why you mean no? Misery love company. Lazy people love to find other lazy people. And you'll find them in the daytime, everybody working. Those people know how to gather together. They know where to gather together. They're either outside on a corner, or under a tree, or, or at somebody's house playing with an Xbox. <laughs> yeah, they, they're lazy. And, 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 and God does not endorse, lazy. he doesn't support it. Matter of fact, he tells us, let the lazy person learn so they can wake up. Hallelujah. Well, uh, this is some good teaching. This is where we live. Somebody, well, 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 where is the spirit? All in Proverbs. The spirit of God is all over this wisdom. See, God know where we live. And God know the kind of people that we live among. And what Proverbs does, it deals with the reality of life. And there are some people, even naive Christians, don't like to face reality. Call it faith. Faith is not denying reality. Faith is trusting God in the midst of reality. All right, let's go on. The last thing, verse 16 says, the lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. I call this brains to be broke. 
Yes, the lazy person is highly opinionated. However, his degree <laughs> is from the University of Laziness. I'm telling you, a lazy person got every excuse in the book. They think they are so smart. And some people crown them. Like, you know, that person lazy, but they, they, they are smart. They are intelligent. Now they're stupid. Yes, they're not smart. If they were smart, they wouldn't be lazy. Yes. No, no, they are, they, they, they graduated from the University of Laziness and they got to throw that degree away, burn it up. You don't want that degree in your library that you came from the school of laziness. Well, let's go on now. Now, wisdom closes, closes out this lazy person. You, I mean, you can look at some of the attributes of a lazy person. You know, I'm sure you've met some of these people. I'm sure some of them in your family, <laughs> hallelujah, you got to be real with it. It's laziness. Uh, sometimes people, you know, you don't know what happened to them when they were a child. Come on, we got to get out of that boat. We all have some things happen to us. You get born again, thank God for the Holy Spirit because he comes and heals the brokenhearted. Now, there are people that may have to get professional help, and I'm not dismissing that, but we can't keep hiding behind that boat making excuses for lazy people and people who want to operate in a foolish manner. And blame somebody else. You know, all that time. Well, if his daddy was in his... Yeah, I'm telling you, get away from that boat. When we grow up, we are uh, called that when I was a child, I act like a child. I behave like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. It's time to grow up. It's time to take responsibility. It's time to stop making excuses to be lazy and to realize that it's the diligent person. It's the disciplined person. It's the person who's willing to do the work and reap the harvest. Hallelujah. Yes, if you are farming, you're farming on God, and you out there doing all that work, you should be the first partake of it. Why? Because God honors that labor. Well, let's move on. Verse number 17, we're coming to another person, and this person he's going to identify here is the person I call the mischievous person. Person always starting stuff, always causing con causing contention and, and, and quarrels in, in, in families. Yes, they, and they bring that same spirit. They bring it in churches. You know, we call them troublemakers. Everywhere they go, they stir up stuff. Well, Proverbs talks about that kind of person and tells us we need to avoid this person. All right, verse 17 says, He who passes by and meddles in a quarrel, not his own, is like one who takes a dog by the ears. I call this nose dripping. Yes, nose dripping. Some people live to stay in other people's business. They only make the matter worse and intensifies the situation. It's like, uh, man, you grab a dog here if you want. It can be a little mutt. You can be a little passive dog. Boy, you start grabbing that and bring that pain, that dog going to fight back. And there are people like that. They'll go and get in other people's business and make the matter worse. They'll go and tell stuff and run their mouth about stuff and make the matter worse. They'll go and tear up a family. Yeah, all because what? They are nose dripping. <laughs> you need to wipe your nose and deal with whatever is causing it to drip. Because all you're doing is causing Proverbs said They call fights. They call strife. And get this, the Bible say it is, it, it is not their own. They don't have nothing to do with it. All right, let's go on. Verse 18 and 19 said, Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. I call this the armor of joking. The mischievous person creates major harm and once found out, throws up the I was joking flag. Or, I'm just playing or I'm just teasing. Sometimes people can say things and, and you know people say the most truthful things are said in a joking way. And sometimes people, you know, they ain't got no backbone. They can't come straight up and talk straight to people and, you know, and deal with people. And they beat around the bush with these jokes. But really, the jokes is a cover up. Yeah, yeah. And so the Bible say this type of person is a, mischief, is, a, is a mischievous person. They're not genuine. Yeah, they're not genuine. You know, we call them, you know, they think they slick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the Bible say watch out for that kind of person. Okay, let's look at verse number 20 and uh, down to verse number 22. He said, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no tail barrier, strife ceases. As charcoal is the burning coal and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. 
The words of a tailberry are like tasty triffles, and they go down into the innermost body. I call this settling the matter. Most strife can be settled by finding the dog whisper. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, get this, uh, the FedEx of bone delivery. Yes, people who carry the bone. You got to remember that when people bring you a bone, they got it from somewhere. Yes, and you got to be careful because a lot of time these people are causing what? Contention and strife. They're going back telling, and you know, they know how to cover it up now. They know how to put it in the right package, and they'll come across, you know, they'll wrap it something like this. Now listen, you didn't hear this from me. Well, evidently, I am hearing it from you. In other words, what they're saying is, uh, don't tell nobody what I'm telling you. You got to be careful with a tail bearer, because if they bring a bone, they'll carry a bone. And sometimes, you got to call people to the table. Yes, and a lot of times, people that are tail bearers, they don't like for you to do that. In other words, let's have a meeting, even in your family, even in your family. Call for a family meeting with the ones who have this contention going on and saying, well, you know, she said, but, but he said. Call all the he said and she said to a meeting and sit down and watch how the lies get revealed. Watch how people will sit there and recognize, see, you've been talking out of both sides of your mouth. You've been bringing one bone to me and taking the bone from me to that person, but then you got another bone you got from somebody else in the family. You just, uh, you, you're the FedEx of bone delivery. And the Bible say we got to avoid these people. You got to mock these people. That's what Romans uh, chapter 16 said. Why? They, because they sow divisions. And see, when Romans 16, Paul was concerned about the unity of the fellowship. And when you got people who come to sow division and stuff, man, the best thing you can do is get rid of those people. Yeah, the best thing you can do is say, Lord, get these people out of here. Why? They're there just to cause division, cause strife, and contention. As soon as they can't get their way, they go what? They go talking to somebody. You know, they, you know, as soon as they get their feelings hurt, as soon as somebody don't do what they think they should have done, and they be hard on the pastor. Oh, they be hard on the pastor. They'll be like, oh, the pastor didn't do this. Oh, the pastor didn't do that. Like God gave you a pastor so they can just run behind your mess. I <laughs> know God gave you a pastor so they can what equip you for the work of the ministry so they can love you with the love of Christ so they can model in front of you what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. Yeah, but no, he didn't give you a pastor to go behind you and babysit you. But people will do that. And then, you know, when they got an attitude, you can kind of discern it when you walk up to them because evidently you didn't do something they thought you should have done or you didn't show up at a place they thought you should have showed up at. Now, those are selfish people. And what they do, they go and they start telling people to try to what? To try to make it look like you're not a caring person. You're not a compassionate person. All because you didn't dance to their music. Don't you let those people cause you to get out of the will of God. Well, let's move on. That's the, that's, that's, that's the mis mischievous person. You got to watch out for a matter of fact. Here again, wisdom say, avoid, he didn't, get this. he didn't say don't love them. He didn't say don't pray for them. But you can't have them in your corner. You got to avoid them. All right. Now wisdom comes to this last person here that he reveals. And this is the malicious person. This person is the master of disguise. These people dissimulate their hatred under a cloak of friendship and flattery. That's how they do it. They can wear a mask. But eventually, if you give them time and they go through a test, they will reveal their true colors. And it's sad how naive Christians can't see these kind of people when they show up or they show out in the church. Listen to the voice of wisdom. Verse 23 through 26 reads, Fervent lips with a wicked heart are like earthenware covered with silver and dross. He who hates disguises it with his lips and lays up deceit within himself. When he speaks kindly, do not believe him, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Though his hatred is covered by deceit, this, his wickedness will be revealed before the assembly. I call this section here glitter but not gold. Some of us grew up with that. Everything that glitter 
is not gold. The inferior silver was used to overlay earthen wear, and it gave the vessel the appearance of being valuable. Some of us grew up with what we call gold-plated jewelry. Yes, yes. I remember back in the day where, you know, there was a time where men dressed it, boy, you would have to wear your shirt kind of all the way down and, you know, it had the wide collars and, and you had your chest out and you will get you a gold chain, get you a gold something to put on there. <laughs> and if you played basketball with that gold chain on, you go have glitter all over your neck and everything. Why? Because that's not the real thing. It looked good, but that was fake gold. And when that sweat got on it, what happened? That gold started disassembling. Well, this is how this earthen vessel that's covered with silver was. Well, it's not real. It's fake. Well, hypocrites, are, uh, uh, hypocrites express friendship fervently with their lips. You got to be careful when people speaking all this stuff about you. I tell you, I, I, I've been pastoring for a while. I hear people get up and, you know, not that you know, there's some genuine people now. The Bible tells us we give honor to his honor due. That's what uh, the Bible tells us, instruct us in, in, a, in a Thessalonians to do. So we're not dismissing that. But I'm talking about when people say this flattery stuff, but they don't say it to you. They don't even have that kind of relationship with you. <laughs> they don't, get this. They don't even, even associate with you beyond the church setting. Boy, but when they talk, you would think, boy, that was your bosom buddy. Well, I'm telling you, that's deception. It goes on. Uh, th th these people heart, according to verse 26, these people heart are wicked. Yeah, they are full of deceit. They become good at this stuff, though. They, I mean, they become good with these words. But if, 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 if verse 26 says what's going to happen is that eventually their true colors are going to get revealed. Get this. In the assembly. In other words, it's going to be public knowledge. In other words, when the test come, and the time come, and the opportunity come, this person's true heart is going to reveal, going to be revealed. Their animosity is going to come out in public exposure. And even then, when people see it, the naive person still can't see it. Well, the Bible tells us this is a malicious person. This person is selfish, they are consumed with pride, they are deceivers, and they cover it up, they masquerade it with what? With flattery, with what? Smooth words, yes. And did not Romans tell us that these people are able to what? Deceive the naive Christians. Because if you are a mature Christian in the word, if you know how to discern, if you know how to call good, good, and evil, evil, dark, dark, and light, light, if you know how to be real about that, you will know that that person is operating out of the wrong spirit, and that is a deceiver. Well, let's go on. Verse 27 says, whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and he who rolls a stone will have it roll back to him. I call it deceiver's due date. You know, when you buy some things, they have an expiration date on it. Well, I tell you what, deceivers have a due date. You see, the, 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 malicious, the, the malicious person have an expiration date in which the pit and stone will come back to them. Sometimes we grew up telling people, if you dig one ditch, you better dig two. Not in this case. Not in this case. They only have to dig one ditch because the deception and, 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 and the cunning craftiness that they have operated in against someone else is really setting themselves up. I think we see this so vividly in the book of Esther. When Haman deceived the king to get the king what? To give him the authority as if though he had the interest of the king at hand. But really he had an undercurrent spirit to annihilate God's covenant people. But when the truth came, when his due date came, what happened? The same uh, a rope that he had hung and had it built and established to destroy Mordecai and Esther and the people of God was the, was the rope that hung his neck. So you just let deceivers know that they got a due date. And the seeds that they sowed, they're going to harvest them. All right, look at verse 28. It's the last one here in, verse, in chapter 26. Say, a lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it, and a flattering mouth works ruin. I call this twin cities, fake words 
and fake hearts. Lies and flattery may be twins, but they both have the same end. And God is a righteous judge. And so when people go about and they have fake words, flattery words, and operate as a deceiver, you don't have to worry about them. You don't have to be envious of them. Definitely don't desire to be like them. All the Bible tells us to do is to avoid these people. And I don't know about you. You will get to a place in your life when God tells you to avoid certain people, you know to do it. You don't have to go and get somebody else to do it. You know in your spirit that God is letting you know to avoid this person. Even people who claim to be followers of Christ, God will instruct you to avoid them. Why? Because he knows what kind of spirit they operate in. He knows how they masquerade and disguise themselves. He knows how they use what? How they use flattery and smooth words to deceive people and convince people. But here again, they only can deceive the naive people. And it's not the will of God for Christians to be naive, but the Christians to be spiritually intelligent, to be discernful, to know how to be able to look and, as folks say, use some common sense. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that's why the Bible say you don't even go in there sometimes when they talk, the Bible say you don't even give them a, re give them a rebuttal. You don't, even, you don't even give them a response. Why? Because they're trying to win you over. Yes, they're trying to put a thought in your mind, sow a seed in your mind. And God, that's not the will of God for you. And so God wants us to do what? Operate in wisdom. Let me tell you something. Wisdom is not a sign of weakness or it does not allow us to walk around and to be taken advantage of. Matter of fact, it does the opposite. It's a sign of strength and it's so that we can walk in such a way that we will not become prey to those who operate in this manner. That's what wisdom does. It is real now. It reveals the human behavior of the people in our present world and sadly to say, even in the church community. Now, if we were just saying that this only applies to people outside of the body of Christ, but the truth of the matter is that you've got Christians or people who name the name of Christ and they operate sometimes as a fool. They play the fool. They operate sometimes in laziness. They operate sometimes in mischievousness and they operate sometimes in malicious behavior. And even though they name the name of Christ, we have to have wisdom so we can know how to maneuver with these type people. Therefore, whenever you identify the fool, the lazy person, the mischievous person, or who flatters with words but have uh, 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 hypocrisy in the heart, heart, learn to avoid them because that's what the Bible instructs us to do. Never does the Bible tell us not to love people. Never does the Bible tell us not to pray for them. Well, there were times when God told Moses, don't even pray for Israel because of that continued rebellion. He wanted to bring discipline in their life, you know. But there are times that we have to say, okay, God, I just need to avoid this person because this person is playing the fool. This person is lazy and, and slothful. They don't want to take responsibility. They got all kinds of excuses. This person is very mischievous. They always keep something going, negative, contention and quarrels. They have it going on in their own house. They got it going on in other people's houses. They bring it on the job. They take it. I'm telling you, everywhere these type people go, they create, that's because that's part of who they are. They're quarrelsome. They, 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 they love, they feed off contention and strife. They keep something going. Sometimes when you've been raised up in a family and, and, and the parents see your children, you got a lot of children or something, and you say, boy, that's just a mischievous. You always keep something going on in this house. <laughs> but back then, they knew how to what? bring strong discipline. That rod of, of correction would drive that foolish spirit out of a child. Well, people don't discipline children like they did back then, so that's probably why we're dealing with a lot of that today. Well, I want to give you these faith action questions uh, and just something to cause us to be able to think and consider and examine ourselves. First of all, how are you responding to a fool? Are you avoiding them or honoring them? The other question is, how are you responding to the slugger? Are you avoiding them or aiding them? And how are you responding to the fake friend who uses flattery to cover up their hypocrisy? Are you avoiding them or are you remaining in their line of fire? See, see, sometime in life, we as Christians have to make the tough choices. 
And we have to go with the wisdom of God. And when you go with the wisdom of God, remember, you are not to be a man pleaser. Because there will always be those who try to come and in their false humility, in their misconception of grace and love, try to judge you as if though you are wrong or that you are, uh, are not walking in love. Watch out for these naive Christians. Yeah, these are very naive Christians. I've seen them. And, uh, and, and matter of fact, uh, these are Christians sometimes you try to avoid because uh, really they don't do good. They don't do good. That passiveness and, you know, that that uh, what I call uh, false humility. Yeah. Yeah. They come across like they're very humble and all this stuff here. But you look at another side of their life. They still got unforgiveness. They still bring up stuff from the past with people that that, you know, even in their uh, relationships. They still bring up stuff that they did long time ago, even in marriages, even with the children, you know. But then on the other side, when it comes to somebody else, they try to be what? They try to look at this, this uh, present themselves like they're so humble, you know. Those, those people need help. <laughs> you just pray for them. They're kind of they're weird. They're kind of weird. Well, I want to say the world alive uh, leaders, I look forward uh, to gathering together this this coming Saturday. We've been having a time where we've connected uh, through Zoom and virtually. But, uh, uh, you know, I sense the time that we just come together in person and we're going to be uh, gathering right here at Word Alive from 12 uh, noon until 130 for for some leadership our iron sharpen and iron moment. Now, you know, we, you know how we operate here in the wisdom of God and we don't want people to ever feel like they're being pressured if they're not comfortable. So if you're still not comfortable assembling with people for whatever reason, uh, we want to respect that and, 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 and we want you to follow your heart in that regard. But please do communicate to let us know uh, if or not you're going to be uh, a, a part of the assembly on this Saturday if you're wearing the badge of a leader. Well, thank you for spending time with me in the word of God. And I want to let you know that this is the book of wisdom. This is not the book of Pastor Curley or this is not the book of Word of Life Church. This is the book of wisdom. God instructed us by the spirit of God, I really believe, to just travel this course of going through the book of Proverbs. And I want to encourage you, if you're a parent and you got teenagers in your home, uh, find some kind of wise strategy uh, to implement time where you can begin to take them through this journey of Proverbs. You may not uh, go through it like I'm going through it, every verse like this, but try to create an environment that they're not forced to sit there and listen to you or anything, but that they're excited about uh, 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 going through this book of wisdom and make it practical. Make it, I mean, they are going to be able to identify with because it deals with where we live. They got, they, they know what it means to have fake friends. They know what it means to have people who uh, act like a fool. They know what it means to have people who just want to use you and, and take advantage of you and be lazy and think you are responsible uh, 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 for uh, meeting their needs and all this kind of stuff. They I mean, it's just the world we live in today. We live in a relational world. And no matter who you are, you got to deal with relational issues in life. And wisdom gives us uh, uh, the insight we need and how to be able to, first of all, to be relationally healthy ourselves and to be able to identify unhealthy people in relationships and how to use wisdom when dealing with those type people. Well, thank God for the word of God and thank God for the wisdom that he has revealed in the book of Proverbs. God bless you and have a wonderful day in the precious name of Jesus the Christ.